welcome to episode three. Can you believe that we've actually done three amazing episodes so far? Well, no, we've done two. I'm lying. I'm lying a little bit. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Maybe I should save this for the end, but I'm excited uh, with this journey that we've gone. And I just want to thank everybody that has liked, has comment, has shared a message, shared this with somebody. Um, I've seen like the shorts kind of blow up a little bit. So I'm just thankful and I'm grateful to everybody who's a part of this journey with me and supporting this little vision that I got here. With that being said, today is, I always kind of say this, right? But like for me, it's really important that I'm able to feature and have discussions with people because when we're doing the show, it's not about I've got like these questions and like, okay, let's get to question one and then get the answer and then question two and then get the answer. That's not my intention. My intention is to dive deep, um, have real conversations, raw conversations. And the one thing that we have about our guests today is that you can um, search her name on Google and you can find out so many amazing things she's done, previous interviews and things like that. And my intention, like I said, is that it's not to repeat those uh, conversations. We'll definitely uh, link those and bring those discussions together. But we want to get to know them as a person, uh, why they do the things that they do, and uh, what visions they have for themselves. So today, uh, without further ado, uh, we have an amazing guest. We have Crystal uh, Ramroop, who is an amazing um, author. Uh, she's written some amazing publications. Uh, she has an amazing blog, which is The Art of Storytelling, that I was checking out. And as well, she's actually an aspiring film and television actress. And when I was doing my research on Crystal, the one thing is that um, she's done so many cool things in terms of like short films. And um, I hope we get like a part two to misled uh, that she did uh, many years ago. And it's it's important that we actually have and preserve that a little bit. So with that being said, uh, we want to welcome to the Logistics Monk Show. Crystal, we're so excited to have you on today. Good afternoon. How you doing? Hi. Good afternoon. I'm doing well, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me on here. Yeah, we're, we're honestly so honored to have this conversation and spark it a little bit. So about, I, I know it, it's always um, a general question to ask somebody, hey, tell me about yourself and things like that. Like, how can you really truly tell yourself the, like, I'm 34. How can I talk about 34 years of my life in a couple sentences, right? So let's start with your academic, um, your your educational background a little bit, and then we'll, we'll go get into it a little bit. So yeah, tell what, what was your educational background? Um, yeah, so I, I graduated in 2019 um, from the City College of New York, downtown Harlem. You know, it's it's such a melting pot over there. Um, I enjoyed my time, though, in college. Education was something that was instilled in me from a young age, and that was something that we had to take seriously. You know, both of my parents did not finish schooling in Guyana. And so when they immigrated to America, the priority was that their children would take their education seriously. So um, one of my mantras was to study your books and not boys. And <laughs> I think I did that very well. So um, I hold a, a bachelor's degree in English with a concentration in creative writing. And then I also minored in theater and Jewish studies. The latter was, you know, something that just happened out of the blue. I was filling in Jewish studies classes for a lot of empty gaps within my college schedule. And I ended up finding out that I took enough classes to minor in it. So I was like, what the hell, let's go. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's been an eventful academic career. I mean, elementary school, my elementary school is still down the block. Um, junior high school, I was always looked at as exotic in a primarily Irish location. And high school wasn't, uh, it wasn't high school musical for sure, but, um, you know, it was, it was such an interesting journey to kind of meet new faces and really find yourself as, as a human in high school. So I understand, and, and I love those points because like there's there's a lot to kind of take in. So let's actually start with like your parents uh, coming from Guyana. Um, and like you said, they didn't finish school. And so they always kind of want to, um, and I would assume maybe their parents didn't finish school as well, or maybe it was a different different situation with that because you find generational, um, it kind of leads on because I'm, I'm sure like when, if you decide to have like kids and things like that, you're going to push that on too, right? No Absolutely. study books, no yeah. boys. <laughs> What was that looking, what, what did that feel like growing up, knowing to the fact that, hey, you got to, you got these quote unquote, I, I don't say strict because like I know with my parents, we would perceive it as being strict parents, um, but they really want us to instill an education because that's the one thing they can't take away from you. But how did that feel like to you growing up? Um, for me, it felt 
it felt normal. I did, you know, get this perception of my parents being strict, but then I also looked at my environment and, you know, the way my friends were carrying themselves, the way that my cousins would carry themselves, the way aunties and uncles would react about school um, or other strangers that, you know, I would see and, and hear conversations and things like that. But for me, there was there really was no other way. I was like, every other thing could leave you. And like you said, everyone can take something away from you, but your education. And that was something that I was always hearing as well. Another mantra growing up. And I I didn't see a problem with it. I took my education very seriously. It was something that I knew at that age, you know, your memory and the way that you carry yourself. It was integrated well into my life and it has shaped me, you know, who I was in college and who I am now um, as a working professional. So education is, it's the way to go. Not everyone has that accessibility to it. So the fact that I was able to have an education is something that I'm very grateful for. And you've kind of like paid that forward. Like I know we'll, we'll get into the, the latter part of like your career uh, being a teacher and helping out, um, just kind of spread that as well. One thing that you also mentioned was uh, the Jewish studies would kind of pique my interest a little bit. Um, if you mind me asking, um, did you grow up religious um, in a certain faith? I did. So I was Christian, and I still am. Um, that's what I, I grew up with. Um, what the beauty of, of being Guyanese is that you grew up with, you know, Hindus and Muslims and Christians. And so a lot of my family is very mixed. You know, we're a melting pot of religions. And so being Christian was something that I, as a Christian, I don't, think I'm like, you know, some of the other Christians who are more public, I like to keep my relationship with God pretty private. Um, and so, you know, there are things that I may not share on social media. I, I Nowadays, I'm like not as active on social media, but, you know, my, my religion is something that is very important to me. And just like education, it's something that I do want to instill. It, it has become a roadmap to life. So education and roadmap, sorry, education and your faith has become a roadmap. How did that, um, how did education and faith help you through, let's say, we always talk about the good times uh, when things are going great and things like that. And obviously our lives are not going to be always great. So how did those times, I want to say trying times um, that you personally faced yourself. And I feel like in our culture a little bit, being uh, true and myself, is that if we're kind of going through a little bit of problems, um, maybe my generation kind of kept it to ourselves. Um, so we kind of like didn't didn't speak out about it. But to your knowledge and yourself, how did those two things factor into your life? There was an incident early last year, and um, it was in the educational sector when I was still working um, as a teacher. And I had ended up leaving the CUNY system and I went to work at a charter school. It was the first time I worked at a charter school, so I was not used to their schedule, their curriculum, and things like that. But I took the chance. I needed to get out of the last job, and I was like, okay, well, this is something that I I could explore. And I prayed a lot about it because in the back of my head, I still remembered my classmate from high school asking if I wanted to die young when I said I wanted to be a teacher because of how stressful the the sector was and being in a classroom was. And um, I went through three weeks of hell and it was unlike anything I had ever faced. And I, I don't ever want it to sound like an exaggeration, but it was also still during the pandemic. And um, I, I prayed about it and I was like, I need to make a choice that, you know, I want to get up every day and be happy to go into work, to feel motivated, um, to feel ready to teach these kids who are going to be the next generation. And I prayed, I thought about who I was, you know, and how I was behaving as, as a toddler in school, you know, it's a new generation of kids, a new generation of parents, and taking all that into consideration, I, I ended up leaving that job. But, you know, taking my faith and my education with me throughout that journey, it was a lot of reflecting, you know, I, I was in the middle of um, snack time with the kids, and I kind of just 
I looked to the ceiling and I kind of spoke to God in that moment. I was like, is this what you really want me to do? You know, like, just take me back for a bit and, and have me reflect on, on different moments in my life and, and where I should be um, in a professional setting and using the talents that he's blessed me with. I mean, that is something that I'm ever grateful for. It's not just me. It's it's him. And knowing that there is that higher power, and I truly believe in the universe is always going to conspire with us uh, yes. for, to, to make everything happen. You just said something that um, I want to pose a question to you is that uh, you ask God, hey, please put me in the position that you need me to be in um, and that you need to be in where you are right now. And it, not just professionally and academically, but your personal life. Just when you look at your life from a 50 foot thousand view, do you feel that you are where you need to be or do you still feel like there's another stepping stone that you kind of need to get in your journey? I feel like, I mean, I'm 26. So at 26, I, I personally feel based on my experiences and, and everything that I've gone through so far, I am where I need to be. I, I grew up questioning who I was. I was different. You know, I was more introverted and a lot of things I started to embrace and I started to be okay with. So I'm like, this is who I am. Um, this is the way God made me. It's okay to not try to fit in and force myself to fit in. Um, I've unintentionally been going AWOL on a lot of people just because, you know, the world gets to be a lot sometimes and using my art to escape has, has really helped me, but I feel content. Um, I feel like the switch in profession really helped me to tap into something else that I was good at. It wasn't just, you know, teaching. It was also being an artist and, you know, what I could do on that end. So I feel like in this moment and, and in this time, in this chapter of my book of life, I, I feel, I feel good. I'm happy. I'm, I'm really happy for that, Crystal. I think that is amazing that you're sharing that and like you kind of look at that as well. And when you said that you've kind of gone like a wall a little bit um, on certain people, uh, that reminds me of like Alex Ramosi, who's a business owner who I follow a lot. And he was saying that there's certain times in his life that he does like season of no's. Um, so he will sacrifice like, you know, the hanging out or the conversation, because let's say somebody messages you and they're like, hey, let's go grab a coffee. It's not just like that one hour, two hour, three hour, whatever, how many times it's just that you're preparing, you're mentally preparing, like, what am I going to talk about? Or yeah. even on the ride there and things like that. So it's just kind of like taking away uh, from your cup of filling that up. So. Can you talk a little bit about, because you went from teaching um, to being an artist, which is something that I think is amazing. What did you, what have you learned? And is there certain things that you miss about your previous um, career? Um, being an artist, well, I, I've been writing since I was eight. And so when I got older and I realized that writing was something that I personally enjoyed, I still inhabited this fear of letting my stories go. And then I realized oh my gosh, people in my community actually need these stories because like me, they didn't grow up reading about Indo-Caribbean characters or ca Caribbean characters in general. Um, for me, it's it's been incredible just tapping into my artistry and, and feeling comfortable and kind of silencing aunties and uncles when, you know, because it's taboo, you know, they want you to be a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer. And um, when you feel confident in who you are and, and the work that you could produce as an artist, I mean, it feels like you're on top of the world. And it's important, especially in our culture, to accept those non-traditional careers yep. um, and to be supportive. Uh, I, I thank God for blessing me with supportive parents, you know, who, who I remember, you know, my first publication in college, my parents came out to the opening night and, um, I was like, I never would have seen this happening because I was someone who always sheltered my stories and didn't feel comfortable um, having people read them. And um, I mean, it, it's been it's been quite incredible, the journey from being that eight year old to accidentally networking with artists, you know, in the UK and in L.A. and uh, in India who are in the film industry, you know, in these movies that I grew up watching. So. You know, it, it's it's completely surreal, but um, every day it's a learning day and every experience and every person that 
I feel could be worthy writing material, um, you know, I take it and I run with it. What I miss about my previous job is sitting down in a room of, you know, 25 kids. And, and mind you, I was teaching on Zoom during the pandemic. So I had extroverted kids. I had introverted kids who wanted us to be, you know, in the classroom, be in, you know, all our little mini groups when it came to writing and, and analyzing all these stories. But I, I miss the conversations, um, the very deep discussions, the watching videos to understand stories that I would give them if I was setting it in South Africa and it's about apartheid and, you know, I'd throw in my two cents about my knowledge on that. It's, it's so incredible because I didn't realize the impact that I would have on their career as high schoolers teaching them in a college course. And um, other moments that I miss are when some of my students would use my office hours to just come and invent about their AM class professors. And just knowing that they were able to trust me enough um, to kind of unload all that information on me. I mean, those are the small things that I I miss. Of course, you know, secretly like staying up until 3 a.m. I kind of miss it, you know, to grade papers. And, you know, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, who doesn't miss that, right? Like, yeah. let's see. <laughs> and, mean... it's, and, and it's amazing that you're sharing that because I think it's important. One thing you said was like eight-year-old. You keep bringing back that you started writing when you were eight years old. When I, for anybody who's watching out there and uh, myself as well, if I was to go through all uh, the publications that you've written yourself, would I learn more about Crystal the person or would I learn about how Crystal perceives the world? Mm, that's a really good question. Uh, I like that question. Never have been asked that before, but I think you would be able to gain a bit of both. I like to induce a bit of myself and my characters and through my narration. Um, a lot of people who know me, and I mean, now that you know I'm on here, um, I'll always try to throw in Heineken. Heineken is something I love to drink, but unless you knew me, like that was, that's a repetitive beer that usually occurs in my story. So it's small things like that, but also the personality of characters and not just female characters, but male characters. Um, so a little bit of my personality is what I like to induce in, in my stories, but also the way I perceive the world. Um, I like, you know, I, I like to imagine a perfect world where there is no violence you know, there, there is no hate, there is no crime. We're all one, we're living peacefully, we're going about our daily lives. Um, unfortunately, the world doesn't work that way. And so, you know, I, I, I love to bring in reality and how my characters battle their environments, their realities, um, finding their identity in those realities as well. And so my perception on how I see things and along with bringing in myself to my characters. I think that mashup is is what makes my stories my stories. I love that a lot. And shout out to um, to, to Panda Bisram from uh, If John Be Holy or something like that. That, that was a great, uh, <laughs> I was reading that before uh, we came on today. And uh, by the way, we'll put a link down to, um, like we said, you can go to uh, her website, uh, The Art of Storytelling. Uh, that is her blog and all her publications. And you've done some really amazing things that I've kind of seen, even like Brown, I think it's Brown Girl or Brown Gal Magazine. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. But just to kind of see the kind of evolution of having these conversations. Our first episode, we had Finay. And like I said, my intention for having these discussions is not to repeat what we've you've talked about a million times before. When I look at your blog specifically, um, you talk about CPL, um, you talk about the SR music, as you can kind of tell. I'm a little bit of a musician. Um, not good, but a little bit of a musician. But um, and you talk about different things that are that have shaped your life. You talked about um, being a melting pot growing up in New York with different uncles, aunties, Hindus, Muslims. We're all celebrating as one, as you just kind of mentioned, you hope for a world that is one. When it comes to like being a writer and the way that you perceive yourself uh, from there, when at that point, when you were eight years old, did you realize that you wanted to be a writer? I realized at eight that I wanted to be a writer when, you know, I, I go back to third grade and that Irish potato famine project. And it was something I, I love traveling the world. Um, I grew up with watching Bollywood movies and I always wanted to go to India one day, but 
setting my stories in different parts of the world was something that I enjoyed doing. And it was only recently that I started setting it in New York. I was like, you're a born and bred New Yorker. You need to like pay homage to, to your home. But um, I, I really valued feedback. I remember, you know, my teacher marking my paper with her red pen and I was, you know, very keen on getting that, you know, those pages back and looking at all the comments that she made and understanding, okay, well, what can I improve? It, it's something that I've been thriving on. And, and that's why I like to hear from people who read my story and kind of like get their take and their perspective on what's going on. But um, yeah, I mean, that third grade class, it's, I could still remember it. I still remember like standing behind the teacher while she was sitting on a chair and she's marking my paper. Um, but that was something that was, that was something that I, I realized that this allowed me to, when I didn't want to really communicate with people, it allowed me to communicate in words on paper. Um, some of my cousins, well, a few actually, not all of them, will remember my black and white marble cover notebook days. And I would literally walk around with that notebook. And there were so many ideas scribbled in there, pages after pages of just nonsensical writing when I look back at it because I still have that marble marble cover uh, notebook but um but yeah I mean that was that was the moment um and then as I got older it was something that I didn't really tap into until I was back in high school and then you kind of realize like writing projects and essays and things like that you kind of navigate okay well what is my niche and what am I good at I felt like sometimes um these analytical essays kind of took away from my creativity and mm -hmm. I always kind of beat myself up about it. And then I'd have one or two professors come through and be like, no, this was great. Um, and I was like, Oh, okay. So this is me like not putting in a lot of effort to be creative, but more analytical and it paid off. But, um, but yeah, I mean, high school was like the other time that I, I realized, okay, well I could get back into writing. And that was the point in my life where I was experimenting and then I realized this is something that I'm good at and it's something that I need to tap into. And you definitely are. And it's something that we definitely encourage that you can continue to do that. Um, when you Earlier on, you mentioned that uh, when you had your first show, like your parents came out and then that was so amazing for you to see that for like the first time that they saw you. And then um, you've mentioned other things about uh, being uh, being happy about where you are in life. How does it make you feel um, when somebody does read one of your articles or sorry, one of your publications and uh, they reach out to you and they just like, hey, man, I've really enjoyed this um, thing. Like what 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 emotions are, are invoked uh, when, when something like that happens? I mean, I, I'm usually pretty anxious about so many things. And I feel like as I've gotten older, I've gotten a little more anxious, but it feels overwhelming. But at the other end of it, it's like I feel so much pride to be able to have let that story go out into the world for people to now acquire. Um, it's such a rewarding feeling and, and it's a humbling one at that as well, because I feel like I've done due diligence to whatever story, you know, I've conjured up from the beginning of drafting it and, and trying to play around with an idea to then seeing it as a finished product. And when I get those messages, I'm just like in awe of, of, you know, the, the love for a certain character, the hate for another, um, you know, and, and purposeful things that I do, people will pick up on it. And, and it's, it's really great. I mean, just an, a range of emotions, but, um, but it's one I'm, I'm very grateful for. I'm grateful to have an audience um, that enjoys my stories and also an audience that may not particularly enjoy the stories because at the end of the day, I don't write for everyone. Um, mm. But whoever is game, I mean, I'm good. <laughs> You're good either way. In our conversation, um, I had the, the honor of ch chatting with you a couple of days ago, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed that conversation. I'm thoroughly enjoying this one. What my take of you, and this is maybe unsolicited, but uh, I'll give a little bit of, of what I kind of think about you, but you're somebody that I come across that is 
wanting to serve, you know, serve a higher purpose. Like, you know, you mentioned uh, your faith and then you, you mentioned that uh, when you did your art school and different things like that. And now with your writing and going on to the um, actress uh, side of it. Can you talk a little bit about, because when I was doing a little bit of research, um, you actually ran like Sunday schools. So you've actually taught at a faith level, faith level, and then you've uh, taught at educational level. And then even with your writing, you're still teaching, even though you're not physically teaching on Zoom anymore uh, with the kids and grading papers till 3 a.m., you're still teaching. How important has that been, um, that ability to serve? Have you seen that with your parents, your siblings, your grandparents, even your, anybody around you? Uh, what does serving look like to you? Um, serving for me, it's it's being humble. Um, that is something that I've been taught at, at such a young age. And knowing that in my genealogy research and, and even hearing stories from my parents about their parents and the way that they served back home in Guyana, it was small little things. Um, and I'm not someone who likes to do, you know, big actions that gets recognized and things like that. Um, just the smallest things. I, I remember, you know, my mom's, my mom was talking about her parents and there were times when they would cook and invite the homeless to their home, you know, wash their hands and feed them and make sure that they were clothed and fed. Um, my, my paternal grandfather, who was just such a selfless man um, when it came to cattle and making sure everyone in the family was taken care of. My paternal grandmother, who would always look out for everyone in the village because she was like the boss woman. Um, so small things like that. And even my parents um, just always putting others before themselves and, and always being helpful. It's it's never them not offering to help. And, and every time you go to a party, I mean, I'm not sure if you've ever experienced this, but I'm sure as a Caribbean, you have that, you know, a party starts at a certain time and you kind of get there like at, on time and everyone else is, you know, trailing in late, but you can never go to a party early and not offer to help. Yeah. It, it, you know, and I, I feel like that is something I have grown up seeing and that's something that I, I do. And then I will admit there was like one time that I was completely fed up that the party was starting late and I was like, I'm not offering, I'm done. Um, but yeah, you know, I, small things like that. I, I was always very observational. And so when I did less talking, I was observing a lot more and small things like that are, are things that I take into account with my own life. Um, serving as a Sunday school teacher was something that I enjoyed. And even though students would come in, you know, an hour late, um, it was something that I, I enjoyed because I was in that position and I had friends, you know, much older who were teaching me in Sunday school. Um, and now we're, we're old adults and, you know, we see the, the new generation of, of Sunday school kids, but then it also became about prioritizing different things in my life, um, you know, and where I needed to be and what I couldn't make, but still trying to keep the faith alive um, and still not forgetting that because work started taking over and if I was doing writing meetings and, and teaching and things like that. So there were times where I was like, okay, well, I don't think I could teach Sunday school because I'm teaching high schoolers for college credit right now. <laughs> so got to so balance like, it a little bit, right? Yeah. You know, I was like, I'll still come to church every Sunday. You'll still see me. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it also became about prioritizing different things, but in any way I can, and, and sometimes I, I do it without even noticing, I will try to be helpful as possible because that's, that's something that was instilled in me in, at such a young age. And it's something that does make me who I am. I love that you said that and yeah you know like even going to those parties like unfolding the chairs and like putting it on the tablecloth and even like prayers and i grew up i'm, I'm hindu but like going to like we got prayers at, like it's six o'clock and like everyone everyone's folding at eight o'clock or like everyone's ready to eat and all that stuff so i completely agree with you um in terms of wanting to serve and zig ziglar who's um somebody that i follow i, I work in sales so i, I always kind of watch these salesy kind of guys but he's always kind of said you know you'll always get what you want 
by helping others get what they want. And that's not the mindset that I'm like, okay, I need to help this person so I get, can get something. Every time that I've helped somebody, Crystal, it's come back to me tenfold. And, I, and I'm sure that you can uh, definitely agree with that as well. Right now, like you said, you've moved uh, from the teaching aspect and you're working uh, for a performing arts um, center um, in New York. Can you tell me and the audience a little bit, just give us a little guidance of how that kind of happened, um, what essentially you do, and what's kind of like something that you aspire to do within that sector? So this job happened because I had a friend from college who was working at the institution and she knew I was someone who had theater experience in elementary school, she, you know, as a fellow writer, she knew that the stresses of the educational sector were, you know, they were getting to me, let's be real. Um, and with the, the great resignation that had happened, um, teachers and professors were up and leaving. And I didn't want that to be the reason why, but it also, you know, being in the professional arts industry and the performing arts industry, it allowed me to kind of explore, you know, the eight-year-old in me is like, you need to go. Um, so I, I ended up getting the job and I currently work in facilities building management which is a bit out of my comfort zone. Um, the admin side is, is what I have down because I do have admin experience um, working in education. And um, for me, it's, it's been a relief. I think the New Yorker in me is also very unfazed about being in the elevator with you know, these artists who are you know, dancers and, and actors. And I'm just like, okay, I'm, I'm going to the ninth floor. Um, I'll, I'll see y'all later. But, you know, we have so many incredible talent in the studios rehearsing all day, every day. And so um, it's been a bit surreal, but it also allows me to kind of breathe in memories of being in college and being in theater classes, but also realizing oh my gosh, I didn't really fit in in theater classes because I was introverted, surrounded by extroverts who were always in your face, very passionate about being theater majors. And, you know, as a minor, it was like, okay, I'm just here. You know, I, I want to explore the craft. Please leave me alone. I'm trying to find a scene partner who has the same synergy as me. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's been a, a welcome change for me. Um, what I would like to see happen, you know, being a writer and having some acting experience, I do want to see a play of mine, like, performed on that stage. Yes. I've been on that stage yes. with um, the ghost light on. I've been in the audience. I was at a dress rehearsal um, for the National Ballet of Canada when they came to perform. <laughs> beautiful, absolutely beautiful. I mean, I was sitting in that seat. The theater lights were dim. The stage is lit. Everyone is out. You know, all these, these incredible artists just dancing their hearts out on stage. And I'm just sitting in my seat with goosebumps and, you know, feeling the emotion of the live orchestra performing, you know, for these dancers. But I mean, it's small things like that. I was like, I can't believe I work at a performing arts theater that I have access to you know, meet and greet actors and, and directors and producers, and then even being invited to dress rehearsal in a work day. Like that's, that's a part of my work day is to attend dress rehearsals. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I would love to see my culture represented on stage yep. because, you know, we're in an industry where we're not fully represented um, as South Asians. How many South Asians can include Indo-Caribbeans, you know, we have, it's a different boat. That's all. Yep. Um, <laughs> that is all. Um, and, and I've met South Asians who have accepted us. I've met South Asians who haven't. But to be fully showcased for all that we're worth, our ups, our downs, um, in our ancestors' experiences, how they mimic our experiences or how they're different, I... I want to write something and I want to see it on that stage. Um, I don't know. Maybe I need to talk to the CEO. I see him every morning. You know, I, I, I would just, I would love to see us on stage. 
well, I feel like you you talked to somebody before, like at your previous job, and they made it happen. So maybe you got to talk to talk to the big man upstairs again, you know, and, and manifest that. And I think that would be so amazing. And I do want to get into like the Indo-Caribbean and ancestry, but I want to do that on a different episode with you because I think that um, for me, I really want to get to know Crystal today, and I want the audience to understand who Crystal is. And um, and I know that's a big part of your identity because I know you can attest to this. Um, Whenever we do those questionnaires or filling out your passports or doing those forms, it's like, hey, man, why, why do I got to put South Asian, man? I'm from Trinidad. Like, you know, there's nothing, you know, they call it China Batura. It's doubles, man. It's doubles. Um, so I'm hoping for the day we can do that, but I definitely do want to do that on a different discussion. Um, I can't thank you enough. This has been so much fun. Uh, it truly has to learn about your journey and where you are and just learning about your your go-getter attitude that I think is amazing. You know, you, you've you expressed many times that, you know, you're pretty quiet and kind of stay in the shadows and kind of observe a little bit more, but your voice is so loud, not literally, but like what you do in your creative work, you know, like you're helping everybody with the dress rehearsals at work, you're helping kids at uh, Sunday school in your previous uh, time, and then you're writing these amazing publications. And I just like honestly encourage you, please do it. Like, please continue sharing your light with this world. I always ask this one last question, and I do want you to, to give me an answer on this one. But other than the ancestry stuff, because like I said, we want to do it on a second. We want to keep it a little bit separate. But is there a question um, that you hoped I asked you today? And uh, what is that? Wow. Um, I think maybe one question could be how film uh, played a role in my life. Um, and maybe even acting, because I feel like acting, film, writing, acting and film sort of integrated its way into, you know, what I was writing about and the way I craft my characters and writing from a, a media perspective in a sense that I wanted to see the movie in my head play out in words. I wanted to make sure that even if it wasn't the same movie, you were having a movie in your head when you were reading my story. Um, so yeah, maybe about film. Um, but other than that, I mean, I really, really enjoyed your questions. Fresh, love talking to you about something different than, you know, everything else that I, I have been feeling about and, and other things. But yeah, no, I mean, this was great. It's such an honor to be on your show. Well, I can't thank you enough. And yeah, we'll definitely talk about film. And I, I had some questions regarding that and we'll, we'll get to like, we, we've got a lot of time and that's the, that's the cool thing with everything there. How can people get a hold of you? How can they find your publications? Tell, tell us about uh, how they can get a hold of Crystal. Um, I mean, for starters, you can Google me. I'm, I'm on Google. Um, you can also follow me on Instagram. You could send me a friend request on Facebook. And if you can't, I'm going to slide into my DMs because, you know, my settings are up on uh, on facebook i'm also on twitter linkedin um and you can also you know send me a note on the art of storytelling connect with me i'm 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 down for it that's amazing so like i said i can't thank you enough uh, for coming on this episode episode three of the logistics monk if you found value in this which i know you did please like comment subscribe and share it with a friend a neighbor share it with your cousins share it with everybody but most importantly Share this with the Amazon driver because we know that you ordered some packages last night on Amazon Prime. So hit that to them. You, they can find some value as well. Uh, we are the Logistics Monk Show. Uh, we go every Monday at 5 p.m. Everybody always asks me why it's Mondays. If you know me, you know why. And I'll tell you the reason is because I'm a Lord Shiva Bhakt and I've coined the phrase Mahadev Mondays. So I figure there's no better day to upload on my favorite uh, day itself. So we'll see everybody next week. I want to thank you amazing people for coming out the support it's been amazing and once again thank you so much to crystal art of storytelling an amazing person an amazing writer an amazing teacher but even better just a better human so thank you for coming out again and uh, we'll see you guys next week take care